I love Israel and honor and respect the Jewish faith and tradition. And it's important that we have a president who feels the same way. For me, respect and reverence for Judaism is personal. My daughter Ivanka and my son-in-law Jared are raising their children in the Jewish faith, always reminding me the important values and lessons we learn about leadership, resolve, and families in Jewish tradition. My administration will stand side by side with the Jewish people and Israel's leaders to continue strengthening the bridges that connect not only Jewish Americans and Israelis, but also all Americans and Israelis. Together, we will stand up to the enemies like Iran, bent on destroying Israel and her people. Together, we will make America and Israel safe again. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people, for I have complete confidence and the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Without debate, Without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Sola decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, 
not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. And it means, finally, that government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. <laughs> مصير مصير سلفه كندي 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 الذي قرر أن يفتش مفاعل ديمونة وأصر على تفتيش اللي يتأكد من أنه يصنع أسلحة ذرية وإلا لا ورفض الإسرائيليون وأخيرا أصر هو على التفتيش كان المخرج من هذه الأزمة هو استقالة بن غوريو استقال حتى لا يوافق على تفتيش مفاعل ديمونة وأعطى الضوء الأخضر بقتل كندي وهكذا قتل كندي بسبب مفاعل ديمونة وصراره على تفتيشه our third story now. A new report reveals Israel has been secretly building its nuclear arsenal since the 1950s. The report by the British daily The Guardian says Israel's nuke programs are based on technology and material Tel Aviv either received from its allies or was stolen by its agents. The report lists the US, France, Britain, Germany and Norway as major contributors to the Israeli programs. It has cited one instance when Israel acquired 20 tons of Norwegian heavy water by the UK. The report has slammed Washington and London for turning a blind eye on Israel's arsenal while pointing a finger at Iran, despite knowing that Tehran is not after a bomb. Israel is believed to possess up to 400 nuclear warheads. Tel Aviv has time and again defied international calls to sign the NPT. From Berkeley, California, I'm joined by Ralph Shawman, author of Hidden History of Zionism. Welcome, sir. Uh, Mr. Shawman, uh, first of all, uh, with this report in, will there be any political and legal implications for those who assisted Israel in acquiring uh, these nuclear weapons? Uh, the question is really uh, uh, going to the, the relationship of imperialism to the Zionist state from its inception. In specific terms, now the issue of the use of nuclear weapons there is a book, The Unspoken Alliance, Israel's Secret Relationship with Apartheid South Africa by Sasha Poliko Saransky, which details the joint development of nuclear uh, uh, weapons, by, including neutron bombs by Israel and South Africa, and their testing. Uh, the uh, uh, well-known uh, figure of Mordecai Vanunu, who was kidnapped by the Israelis when he disclosed the evidence of the Israeli preparations for nuclear capacity and testing of weapons. Indeed, with the, the, the full uh, panoply of evidence pertaining to this, he was kidnapped, taken to Israel, and held in, in, in incommunicado for 18 years. Uh, uh, there is a very uh, sordid and menacing history of the use of these weapons to menace peoples across the world. I want to give a specific e example and an illumination of this, namely the view of the Cameroon disaster which Dan Fisher wrote about in the Los Angeles Times on August 27, 1986. Deaths occurred in which people were found frozen in place as if they had been killed by gas. This was in the, an event in 1986 in the Cameroon. It was immediately described as an event in which the Israelis were involved. Israeli and French troops were soon to be on the scene. In fact, Shimon Peres, who was the uh, former foreign minister and prime minister of Israel was quickly on the scene with a, with a team. And indeed, uh, the, uh, the evidence about this was documented by Dan Fisher in the Los Angeles Times, as I mentioned. But also, uh, there was a detailed account by the uh, Cameroonian journalists 
uh, which specified the role of the Israelis and the evidence of a neutron weapon. The Lake Neos disaster, 20 years after, revisiting the Israeli connection by Dubusi Tande. Maya Wamashon, my wife and I had a, a, a role in this expose because at the time we flew to the big island of Hawaii where a leading volcanologist in the island of Hawaii was involved in the uh, report on what occurred in the Cameroon. He confirmed that the claims that this was the result of gases emerging from a, uh, from a lake, a, a presumptive latent volcano that emitted gases in Lake Neos, those gases that right, reached now, the atmosphere Shulman. and causing thousands of people to die in their right. tracks frozen while no damage to property occurred was quickly exposed as a myth. Okay. In fact, what we're dealing with here is a neutron weapon. One of the people who was most associated with the neutron bomb, Sam Cohen, who was working with the RAND Corporation in the United States, has detailed a neutron weapon. There's no question whatsoever given what Vanunu has disclosed, given the evidence in the Cameroon, that neutron weapons have been used and tested by the Israelis with the approval and collusion of the United States and imperial powers, notably France. This is not a new development. The story is important, but it is the culmination of a series of documentations and revelations over a period of 20 and 30 and 40 years. Uh, all These right. are crimes against humanity. These are ongoing threats to the peoples of the world. They define the relationship of Israel and the Zionist state to imperialism and the utilization of the nuclear capacity and of neutron bombs and weapons of this nature to terrorize the populations they seek to dominate, whose sovereignty they it's wish Bobby to Knight, destroy. Bobby Knight, the Indiana basketball legend who has now endorsed Donald Trump, spoke for him yesterday, spoke for him today. But he's been saying some controversial things. I want to get your reaction because he's, you know, out there at the, on the campaign trail for Donald Trump. Listen to this. Harry Truman, with what he did in dropping and having the guts to drop the bomb in 1944, <laughs> saved, saved billions of American lives. And that's what Harry Truman did. And he became one of the three great presidents of the United States. And here's a man who would do the same thing because he's going to become one of the four great presidents of the United States. That's it. Go ahead. You want to talk? Hello. That's right. Get that mic. Get that mic over there. My, my, can I hold it? Yeah, let him hold it. Let him hold it. See, there's a man, there's a man that knows what he wants. It's my kind of guy. Go ahead. Well, this, you, this might shock you, but um, we have something in common. Good. Respect for human life. Thank you. Okay. Now, I have two comments on my deep respect for human life. Okay. Number one, and you can comment on my objections. Number one and number two. Okay. Number one, I'm opposed to the murder of unborn babies being legal. Number two, I'm opposed to our wasting our military in the Middle East on behalf of Zionist Israel. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, let, let me just tell you that Israel is a very, very important ally of the United States, and we are going to protect them 100 percent. 100 percent. They've been our most reliable. Uh, it's our true friend over there, and we are going to protect Israel 100 percent. As to number one, we all we're with you. OK, uh, one more. We got to ask one more because that was a tough question on Israel. All right. That was nasty. Whoa. Are we all for Israel, right? Yeah. Man. Okay, go ahead. is extending all the way to Pikesville in the form of a traveling museum. The 11 News reporter Jennifer Franciotti shows us the museum gives shoppers at one local shopping center an inside look at current life in Israel. In front of the Green Spring Shopping Center on Smith Avenue is a gray box. It might not look like much, but this small 8 by 10 space is a replica of a bomb shelter. And the tight space inside and the video playing on a TV screen is giving visitors a window into the life of Israelis when sirens go off signaling a Hamas attack. 
really claustrophobic in there. Um, dark. And I'm thinking, like, I'm the only one. Imagine if there were 20 people squished into that little square room. Um, and I'm so sad for the kids who can't have a normal life because they never know when they're just going to have to pick up and run. These are actual recordings of what takes place when uh, Israelis uh, hear the alert. This has been repeated now over 2,500 times in the last three weeks. Rabbi Michael Meyerstein is the executive director of the Baltimore Zionist District, which is hosting the Bomb Shelter Museum. It was created by the organization Artists for Israel, intended to provide a multi-sensory experience. The images inside that dark, cramped space shows the 15 to 90 seconds Israelis have to take cover during a rocket attack. They're trying to like uh, keep them positive and not let them know what's going on, but it's really like sad. This just puts a lot of what you know you hear in the news and radio in perspective. Even though it's just a controlled environment, it still has that effect. It, it gives you a better understanding, definitely, because it's dark and it's enclosed, and that's never a comfortable position to be in. This museum was most recently in Washington, D.C., but it's the first time it's been left in any one location for an extended period of time. And it's right on time, says Rabbi Meyerstein, as the crisis escalates in the Middle East. It's our hope that it will also become a, a magnet for drawing others in the surrounding communities to want to explore and see just what this war is all about. You know, are the Israelis making such a big deal out about a, about a rocket that's coming in overhead? I guarantee you that if just one rocket were to fly over Pikesville today, people would be scared. Jennifer Franciotti, WBAL TV 11 News. I'm losing you. I'll call you back to the ball. The ball. Back to Hannity, and here is part two of our interview from earlier today with 2016 Republican frontrunner Donald Trump. Let me go to the issue of a comment you made last night. We're talking about the Israeli Palestinian right. conflict. The toughest deal to make of any kind of deal that I've ever seen is Israel Palestine. Because it's such a toughest mess. deal. The Palestinians and the Israelis don't exactly. They're not exactly meshing. Yeah. And, you know, one of the reasons that I said it last night, the toughest single deal to make is getting them together. And I've been told by some Israelis that no matter who it is, you'll never do it. I'm, I'm going to give it a shot. But I will say, it is probably of all the deals, right? Well, you it's did mention that the these kids that are funded by Hamas and Hezbollah. They grow up hating. They're growing up to they, hate That's why Israel. it's so tough. They grow up yeah. hating. They grow up, things were told to me that are incredible, and I won't even say How that, important, though, is our alliance? They're the num our number one ally in the region, and that alliance has been, well, fractured in a Israel big way. Israel is so important. Uh, what Obama has done to Israel is a disgrace. How they even talk to us is hard to believe. But Israel, and how they talk to Obama. You know, I have friends, they support Obama. I said, how do you do it? It's almost like they do it out of habit. They agree he's been terrible. Mm -hmm. You look at what he's done to Israel. With just this Iran deal, which is such a terrible deal, he has been the worst thing that's ever happened to Israel. Now, a lot of my friends that are Jewish uh, do not support him any longer, but I still have some that do. I say, how can you do it? He's say, been horrible to Israel. This you know was what? a meeting that was happened. going to last for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and uh, we were just going to get to know each other. We had never met each other. Uh, I have great respect uh, 
The meeting lasted for almost an hour and a half. And it could have, as far as I'm concerned, it could, could have gone on for a lot longer. We really, um, we discussed a lot of different situations, some wonderful and some difficulties. Um, I very much look forward to dealing with the President in the future, including counsel. Uh, he's uh, he explained some of the difficulties, some of the the high-flying assets and some of the some of the really great things that have been achieved. Uh, so, Mr. President, it was a great honor being with you, and I look forward to being with you many, many more times in the right. future. Thank you, sir. There are a lot of votes here. There, there are 300 to 400 thousand potential votes in Israel, and they are many of them are coming from the key states that are going to determine the election in November, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, and others. There, those are states with relatively, relatively large Jewish populations. And that, those Jewish populations have their counterparts here in Israel. I mean, in Florida alone, we think maybe the 10 to 12,000 Florida, voter, Florida voters here. 2,537 votes decided he was going to be president, and they all came from South Florida. 1,500 votes for Bush came from Israel during that election. And if they hadn't voted, he wouldn't have been president. Ah. So your vote is really extraordinarily important. Right. So thank you. Thank you for coming out. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, this is really fantastic. He's a, a great supporter of Israel, and um, I think that he really wants to make a difference in America, which is great. And I think that people should vote for a candidate that's going to be a strong leader, and I think he's a strong leader for not just America, but I think for um, the rest of the world. He understands the importance of Israel. He understands how important the linchpin Israel is in maintaining peace in the world. It's the center of the world. It's the tiniest country, and yet it's the number one country on the news every single day. It proves how important it is. <laughs> if the Clintons have their way, they will bow down to the uh, Middle Eastern majority, and Israel will be in a very, very tough position. Trump is guaranteed he will protect Israel 100%. In America, the Jews are voting 80% on the average for the Democrats over the years. In this election, I think the, the Jewish vote for, for Clinton, to the extent that he comes out, and that's going to be an interesting issue, will be close to 90%. Okay, and uh, but here in Israel, the almost the exact opposite happens. We have 80 to 85 percent over the years voting um, Republican here in Israel, even though most of them were registered Democrats in the United States. And 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 what's going on here is that when people come here to Israel, it's a kind of a self-selecting community. These are people; these are Jews who identify as Jews with the state of Israel. They made a choice, a life choice, to come here. And a lot of the students that come here to, to study in the yeshivot and universities are also doing that. And when they come here, they put, by, by necessity, they're putting the Jewish state and the, and the Jewish people high on their list of priorities, okay? Whereas in the United States, the Jews have a problem with their identity. I mean, they, on the one hand, they're quite assimilated. On the other hand, they vote in a way that's very different from every other ethnic group that, except for the Afro-Americans. And they're voting in huge percentages for the Democrats because of, I think, in my view is a feeling of insecurity they have about Jews. They don't put Israel, most of them, to, uh, more than two-thirds of them, wouldn't put the issue of Israel and the Jewish people or anti-Semitism in the top ten issues that influence their votes. And you're saying that if you put uh, Israel in your top priority, you're it's 100% Trump? You're voting for Republicans. And you know, Trump is the Republican candidate. And the reason for that is the Republican Party, unlike its Democratic counterpart, has shown, and especially this year, an extreme attachment and commitment to the Jewish people. You have to, you have to have been, as I was, at the convention in Cleveland. And I went around with my kippah on my head and my Israel button here, and I had people coming to me from all over the country, from Alaska to Maine, all non-Jewish, okay, coming to me and saying how much they love Israel. We're talking about delegates and people in the and functionaries in the Republican Party. And this is reflected in the Republican Party platform. It's a love affair. It's a love affair between the Republican Party and the state of Israel. And the Jews here, the voters here, recognize this. Donald Trump has every right to be proud of his daughter. 
Ivanka is a successful Ivy League educated businesswoman, author, and mother. She's now helping run his campaign and introduced her father at the Republican convention. Yet at times, his fatherly praise is downright cringeworthy, like on The View in 2006. I said that if Ivanka weren't my daughter, perhaps I'd be dating her. You know? <laughs> Stop it! Oh, it's so weird! Stop it! You know what? You are sick! Far from protecting his daughter from being talked about as a sex object, he has encouraged it multiple times, on Howard Stern's radio show in 2004 and then again in 2006. By the way, your daughter... She's beautiful. A, can I say this? A piece of ass. Yeah. She looks more voluptuous than yeah. ever. She's yeah. actually always been very voluptuous. It's she's tall. She's almost six feet tall. In May, Ivanka described herself as a feminist while defending her father on CBS after a scathing New York Times article about his alleged negative treatment of women. Is there unending commentary on the female form? No, no. I've known my father, obviously, my whole life, and he has total respect for women. Please welcome the lovely Ivanka Trump. Still, even Ivanka seemed confused when talk show host Wendy Williams asked about things the two have in common. What's the favorite thing you have in common? common with your father? Either real estate or golf. Donald, with your daughter? Well, I was going to say sex, but I can't relate that. <laughs> I can't relate that. Donald Trump has always been proud of his daughter. I'd call collect to his <laughs> office. I was probably, you know, 10 years old. He would pick up the phone every single time and he'd put me on speakerphone. It wouldn't be a long conversation. He'd introduce me to whoever was in his office. And he was front row when Ivanka took to the catwalk during her short-lived career as a fashion model. Still, Donald Trump repeatedly points out how hot his daughter is, saying last year in a Rolling Stone article, yeah, she's really something, and what a beauty that one. If I weren't happily married, and, you know, her father. My daughter, she Ivanka. Yeah. She's six feet tall. She's got the best body. Yeah, she's hot. Ivanka continues to defend her father and has said he is not sexist. Earlier, her Twitter account showed a little heart liking an article about her father's decade-old comments to Howard Stern. The Trump campaign directed us to Ivanka's brand manager, and a source there tells us it wasn't Ivanka who personally liked the item. It was, quote, a simple mistake by a staff member. CNN has reached out to the Trump campaign for a response about the comments themselves. A former fashion model came to Israel this week with all the markings of a celebrity. But despite the glamour that surrounds her name, Ivanka Trump arrived with a keen business sense and an eye for a good deal. After closing a deal in Dubai, the daughter of Donald Trump came to Israel to gather information on investments for her father, a trip that could lead the world's most recognizable real estate tycoon to join a growing list of magnates buying a piece of the Holy Land. I would uh, absolutely love to build a tower in Israel. Where? I think uh, Tel Aviv is a tremendous city, I think, for a hotel, Jerusalem, but, you know, Jerusalem is a little bit challenging to find a site because yeah. it's, it's, you know, the preservation and, uh, and it's so built up. Donald Trump is known to trust 26-year-old Ivanka completely and considers her his right-hand woman. Ivanka serves today as an executive vice president at the Trump Organization and is currently involved in 33 different international real estate projects. This is my first time in Israel. So I'm very you, excited. How do you like it so far? I love it. People right. had um, people had sort of prepared me for what to see, where to go, um, what to expect. But I think until you actually see it, I mean, it really feels like you stepped into biblical time.
very public upbringing and her family's assets, Ivanka insists she wasn't just a rich kid. People often assume that at the age of 12 we were given a limitless credit card in which we could go buy the latest, you know, Parisian fashions and that, that, that's a funny concept to me because I think even today, like, I'm too cheap to do that. <laughs> Donald Trump's trust in Ivanka appears to be well-founded, as she has clearly mastered the language of business and persuasion. Now is the time to buy in the U.S. Prices are down. Um, there's been a general plateau, but they're going to go right back up again. So now is a real... Some, something? Exactly. <laughs> I don't think I can afford it right now. Well, you can, okay, because can the try. shekel's never been so strong and the dollar is so weak. Thank you for I'm here today to kick off an international road show, and the support has been so strong right here in Israel that we thought it would be appropriate to commence and give the buyers of Tel Aviv and the rest of the country the first opportunity to purchase in this particular building. I'm a developer. That's where I like to invest. I like to invest in real estate. Israel has always provided us with a host of buyers, whether it be in New York, Chicago, Las Vegas, really all over the world. I have no doubt just from our database of Israeli buyers that we could fill a project fourfold here in the city. Ivanka, hi, thank you for being with us here in Israel. You said before that you are looking into new investment here in Israel. What particularly are you interested in? But particularly, we have a huge group of Israeli buyers in all of our buildings, whether it be New York or elsewhere around America and really around the world. So as we were deciding to launch international sales, that in conjunction with a great local partner in Philadelphia who has strong ties to the Israeli community, we thought that this would be really a great place to, to kick off the tour. And what we're doing with the project is exceptional. I think while I was here, one of the fortunate things I've been able to do is meet with many of my friends who are in the real estate community in New York who are from Israel, um, but to meet with them here, to see their different projects, to see their different sites, and then to meet with um, several other local Israeli business people and really get a feeling for the lay of the land. Um, I think in very short order we'll be announcing a great project here in Israel and it will be a very strong market for, for the Trump brand. Okay. Uh, also this season you took part in your father's uh, reality show, The Apprentice. Um, if you weren't his daughter, would you took part in this uh, kind of reality show? Well, I wouldn't only take part in it, I'd like to think I'd win it. <laughs> Do you find it hard to work with uh, your father who's uh, known for being a very tough businessman and uh, very dominant in his uh, work? I mean, I think within any organization or with any family, it's not always easy, but his... Um, his presence, what he expects and demands of everyone who works at his company, not just me, um, is extremely high. And I think that pushes all of us to do better, to work harder, to, uh, to create more value for the company. And, and you've been in the new plaza. You, your father used to own the new plaza. How was uh, that experience for you? We did. Um, we actually got a great tour by the owners, who you know, I'm sure. Um, of, uh, of the building, and I think they've done just a phenomenal job with it. Uh, well, I know you don't get to say this much, but uh, can you fire me? You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> This has been Marwan Smeda's spot for 50 years. This is the most beautiful city in the world, he says. Our city. For me, these old stairs at Damascus Gate are better than all the castles in the world. He sells fresh juice on some of the most contested land in Jerusalem, perhaps even the world. Here, just outside the old city of Jerusalem, the light rail line at this point very nearly follows the green line. For decades, this has been the line between largely Palestinian East Jerusalem and largely Israeli West Jerusalem. If President-elect Donald Trump follows through on his campaign promise to recognize an undivided Jerusalem, this line may be no more than a light rail line. Jerusalem has always been the most difficult question in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Even after the world recognized the state of Israel in 1948, 
It left the final status of Jerusalem open to future negotiations. Israelis see it as their united capital. Palestinians see East Jerusalem as their capital of a future Palestinian state. The city's mayor, Nir Barkat, says Trump's election means, once and for all, Jerusalem will always be Israel. The role of the city of Jerusalem will never change. It has to be under the sovereignty of the Jewish people. It has to play an inclusive role. It can never function as a divided city. There are already two American consulates in Jerusalem, one west and one east. Trump has promised to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, recognizing the holy city as the capital of Israel. There's even a plot of land picked out. Israel has leased this open field to the United States for $1 a year ever since 1989. This lease runs 99 years, waiting for an American embassy to be built here. But every president for more than 20 years has refused to move it. To do so would break decades of U.S. and U.N. policy. Mahdi Abdel Hadi, a Palestinian political analyst, says the field will stay empty. So what's new? It's only rhetoric, it's only slogan. Although it's very much symbolic to, to tell us, you Palestinians will not have a capital in Jerusalem. And nobody can dismiss our presence in Jerusalem. We are deep rooted here. The morning after the elections, U.S. Ambassador to Israel Dan Shapiro was asked about the promise to move the embassy to Jerusalem. It was a question he didn't want to touch. Uh, you know, I, I serve uh, on the policy of my government. Every government, uh, uh, every U.S. administration that has looked at the question has determined that uh, the embassy is where it should be. Uh, and uh, I can't speculate beyond that. After President-elect Donald Trump takes office, Shapiro may be out as ambassador. An uncertain future in more ways than one. Orrin Lieberman, CNN, Jerusalem. It's the lost Donald Trump video that has people talking. Trump and then-wife Marla Maples appeared on the TV show Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous back in 1994. Host Robin Leach asked about their daughter Tiffany, who was then just a year old. Now, Donna, what does Tiffany have of yours and what does Tiffany have of Marla's? Well, I think that she's got a lot of Marla. She's really a beautiful baby and she's, uh, she's, got, um, she's got Marla's legs. <laughs> we don't know whether or not she's got this part yet, but time will tell. We'll... Daily Show host Trevor Noah dug up the long-forgotten footage. I'm pretty sure nobody has seen this clip since it aired over 20 years ago. And he was left speechless by legs. what he heard. We don't know whether or not she's got this part yet, but time will tell. We'll... <laughs> The clip is being picked up everywhere. The Daily Beast calls the video disturbing. I went to the public library, found the volumes of the Babylonian Talmud that they had there, opened them up, and found this irrefutable, undeniable proof that the Talmud, the Jewish holy book, condones and encourages pedophilia. Kethabeth... 11b says when a grown-up man has intercourse with a little girl it is nothing for when the girl is less than this it is as if one puts the finger into the eye sanhedrin 55b says come and hear a maiden aged three years and a day may be acquired in marriage by coition and if her deceased husband's brother cohabits with her, she becomes his. Sanhedrin 69a says, A maiden aged three years and a day may be acquired in marriage by coition. Coition means sexual intercourse. Yebamot 60b says, a proselyte who is under the age of three years and one day is permitted to marry a priest, for it is said, but all the women children that have not known man by lying with him keep alive for yourselves. So there you have it. You can go to the library and do the same.
Most Christians believe that the Judaism of the Old Testament is very similar to Judaism today. Yet the Jewish Encyclopedia, in its article on Judaism, says modern Judaism and the Judaism of the Old Testament are very different. It says that after Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah in the 6th century BC and led the Jews to distant Babylon, the Jews were faced with challenges to their faith they had never before experienced. Ever since the time of Solomon, the religion of Israel had centered around the magnificent temple in Jerusalem with its sacrifices and ritual. The question now became, how could one be a true Jew in a very foreign, even hostile environment? The need arose for a certain class of lay priests called scribes or sophora to interpret the law in this new setting and make it workable. In time, these scribes became what the New Testament calls the scribes and Pharisees, the greatest legal authorities of Israel for all ages. The Pharisees said there were really two inspired revelations to the Jews. There was the written law of Moses received atop Sinai, but there was also the oral tradition acquired by 70 elders who came to the base of the mountain but were forbidden to proceed farther. The Pharisees said that these 70 elders, or Sanhedrin, received a much more extensive and profound revelation than Moses, a revelation which was never written down, yet took precedent over the written law. When Jesus came on the scene, his reaction was to bitterly denounce this counterfeit tradition. Christ said the Pharisees, by their tradition, had made the law of God of none effect. He considered the Pharisees the most dangerous leadership Israel ever had. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! Hypocrites all! For you set up the kingdom of heaven against men! You do not go in yourselves, nor do you let others enter! Blind guides! You strain at a gnat and swallow a camel! You bow before the letter of the law and violate the heart of the law. Justice, mercy, good faith. You are like whited sepulchres, all clean and fair without, but within, full of dead men's bones and all corruption. You see these stones, do you not? I tell you, they will not be left here The home of the lizard and the spider! Serpents, brood and vipers! How can any of you escape damnation? You shall not see me here again! Not until you learn to cry! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! For I and my father are one and the same!